So it is a real pleasure and honor to be with you uh, for the second week of plagiarism and academic dishonesty. It is a very interesting topic, and it is very nice to collaborate with the professional team of uh, University of Liverpool with Professor Halawa, Dr. Tudora, and today we have Dr. David with us. So it, uh, I think it will be very interesting to have mm -hmm. the applied cases on plagiarism. So uh, Professor Halawa, just a, a small introduction for Professor Halawa, speaker. Uh, he is very interested in the kidney transplantation, transplant immunology, surgery of parathyroid gland, and postgraduate education as well. Mm -hmm. He is consultant general and transplant surgeon, Sheffield Kidney Institute, Sheffield Teaching Hospital, Sheffield, uh, UK, associate professor of University, uh, University of Liverpool, and is program director of postgraduate education transplantation, University of Liverpool, United Kingdom. And one of the achievement of Professor Halawa is establishment of the degree in transplantation. It started with a diploma, and then uh, nowadays it is full master degree in real transplantation science. So congratulations, Professor Halawa, for this very unique and peculiar uh, achievement. Professor Halawa has academic achievement, uh, uh, contributing in more than 76 international presenta uh, presentations, 127 publications, including two book chapters, on the editorial board, and the reviewer in many scientific journal. He is uh, very clever uh, as musician, uh, uh, as he composed, uh, transposed more than 100 music sheets, Egyptian and Western to be played by flutes. And this is one of the very nice photos. And I witnessed the uh, cleverness of Professor Halawa with flutes. Uh, many contributions uh, were appreciated. So Professor Halawa visited Urology and Referral Center uh, in April 2014 and delivered a very nice introduction to cadaveric organ transplantation. It was very nice workshop. And one of the merit of Professor Halawa, he taught and trained many surgeons uh, because he's mastering uh, beside transplantation, uh, parathyroidectomy surgery. So a lot of surgeons here in Egypt and the, in Arab world master the technique of parathyroidectomy after the training of Professor Halawa. This is Mansoura and in many cities in Egypt, uh, in Sohag, in Sohag, in this year, in 2015, he uh, performed transplantation plus a uh, list for uh, many cases of parathyroidectomy. So it was a very great achievement. Uh, in Mansoura, again, with uh, um, uh, the Professor Gamal al Sabi and the uh, Dr. Osama Shahad and Dr. Donia. In Aswan, so, uh, in, again, in, in, uh, in, uh, at the Erosion Referral Center, December last year, he performed four cases, very difficult cases of parathyroidectomy. And the, this is the photo with uh, Professor Ayman Rifai. Uh, it is an honor to chair Professor Halawa in many activities. This is an example, immune suppression and transplantation. It was very exciting uh, uh, webinar. Uh, he delivered many presentations to our Society of Nephrology, and we have uh, a great collaboration with transplantation. This is transplant nephropathology in four Zooms this year. Uh, also, it is a, a very nice opportunity to uh, collaborate with Dr. Tidora. She is an expert in ethics, and uh, it was very nice uh, to, uh, for, from her to attend and to, and to comment on the ethical aspects of in medical, and this was collaboration with Mansoura Medical School. And uh, last week, we have the plagiarism, the first week of plagiarism, uh, uh, talk Professor Halawa and the uh, valuable comments of Dr. Tudora. Um, uh, Dr. Halawa has many collaboration with us in, with Mansoura Faculty of Medicine and the PhD degree in Nephrology. Professor Halawa is uh, the uh, supervisor uh, for was two candidates, and one of them is Dr. Mohammed Al Hadidi, who is joining us in this webinar. And uh, Mohammed is working under complete supervision of Professor Halawa. The in the last week, 
it was uh, the, the first webinar about plagiarism. And uh, this is the, the, uh, the plagiarism, the, this is a YouTube video. And uh, in one minute, the most important the key messages delivered by Professor Halawa, uh, uh, he stated that there is no perfect academic writers. If we believe in this statement that there is no perfect academic writers, the question why do we do copy and the best? So plagiarism is not needed at all. And the philosophy is to avoid plagiarism. And it depends upon culture. And if it depends upon culture, it is typical to be included in medical school education, teaching how to avoid plagiarism. Today, we are eager to hear from Professor Halal the applied aspects of plagiarism because he prepared very exciting, I think, 16 case and examples of scenarios, real life scenarios about plagiarism. And in this uh, Zoom as well, uh, we are going to hear uh, this very exciting topic, uh, title of <laughs> about politics and research misconduct by Dr. Tudora, and you are eager to hear, hear from Dr. Tudora. It is a real uh, pleasure uh, to have Dr. David Aziz, who is the academic director of the master and the PhD degrees of organ trans and, and the postgraduate organ transplantation, the School of Medicine at University of Liverpool. So it is a privilege to have you, Dr. David, with us. And I think this is the last point, and the, uh, I'm leaving the uh, mic just in uh, uh, to uh, Dr. Tamer to welcome all of you, and then Professor Halawa to, okay. to start the okay. Dr. Tamer. Thank you, Thank you Professor Hassan Shaisha, for this wonderful introduction. I, you don't leave anything to say, uh, just to, to welcome uh, Professor Ahmed Halawa. We are waiting for that uh, second uh, part of your presentation. The first one is very marvelous, and we learned a lot from uh, that, and we, we are waiting for the application form. So the, I, I, I expect that this will be the applied form of the, uh, the last uh, uh, lecture. And uh, of course, uh, we are uh, uh, also eager to, to, to hear from uh, Dr. Ditodra and from uh, uh, Dr. Aziz for their uh, presentation. Thank you very much. And the floor uh, and the stage for you, Professor Halaw. Thank you, Professor Tamer. Professor Tamer is the Vice Dean of Mansoura Faculty of Medicine, and he did a lot of efforts. And uh, he, uh, through Professor Tamer, there is a great progress in higher education research in Mansoura Faculty of Medicine. So thank you very much for your presence you. with us. Now, Dr. Uh, Ahmed, the mic is to you, Professor Halaw. Thank you very much. Just, I would like to share screen first. So okay. Means, uh, so I'm going to stop it with the screen from my side. Yeah. And this is allowing you to share the screen. Yes, go ahead, please. Uh, uh, thank you very much for this introduction, and I would like to welcome uh, my partner in crime, uh, <laughs> Dr. David Aziz. Uh, I have to admit that uh, since he joined us, uh, he brought new insight, new vision uh, to the program. Uh, he's passionate about education. Education for him is a passion rather than a job. Welcome, David, and uh, hopefully, you know, we'll have a fruitful discussion today. So part two is a real life scenario. Before, disclaimer, it's important to declare this. This disclaimer informs the reader 
that the views, thoughts, opinions expressed in the text is entirely to me, not necessarily to the author's employer, organization, committee, or group, or other individual, but still based on real life scenarios. All names, places, and many identifiable information provided in this talk were modified to hide the identity of the original researcher. Just quick review about plagiarism. Plagiarism is basically stealing somebody's work without acknowledgement, without paraphrasing. And I would like just to go quickly through the types and the penalty, just because these are the foundations of the scenarios we're going to discuss. Type one, which is copy and pasting. This is the easiest and the commonest way. So copy and paste word for word. As you can see, the software here identified 80% similarity, means 80% of this work submitted work is a copy and paste of another work. Of course, without paraphrasing, without referencing. Patchwork, when you lift sentences, clauses, phrases, it will give you patchwork plagiarism, still plagiarism, or you may steal the idea called intellectual plagiarism. You steal the idea, you paraphrase it, you reword it, but without acknowledgement of the original author. It's unfair. Unintentional, you cite the author in incorrectly or incorrectly cite the journal. It's still plagiarism because you deny the original author the credit. It won't appear in his citation index as a work for him. Or self plagiarism. You republish your work, which is already published, as a new work, like double publications. It is a plagiarism. And there is a penalty for that as well. We don't need to be confused between the type or the shape or the form of plagiarism, the one I mentioned earlier on and the extent, which is the category, the severity, how bad it is. Briefly, category A, minor error, missing quotation mark, minor mistakes or referencing. If it's an assignment, you lose 10% of the, of the mark. If, if it's a paper submitted to a journal, it will bounce back to you to be amended. So it's a waste of time, waste of effort. Category B, poor academic practice, poor paraphrasing, inadequate referencing. You lose a big deal of the mark, basically, if it's an assignment. So it would be capped to 50%, just to be given the pass mark. If it's an article, it will get rejected. And we discussed last time, it's quite often up to quarter, 23 to 25% of the articles submitted get rejected because of plagiarism. The journal these days use software checker, so plagiarism checker. Category C which is a, a very bad plagiarism. Or you presented a very dishonest data. Complete copying, like the one we have seen early on was 80% similarity. It attracts a penalty. You fail the assignment, your paper, you get rejected. You may get legally prosecuted. You may pay fine. And this being shown and you know, I demonstrated this in the last webinar. Category D, 
when you repeat category C again, your study might get terminated. Article, of course, rejected. Again, still legal prosecution, and fine. Category E, basically, if you ask somebody, you pay somebody to, to do the work for you. Even if it is the first offense, you will get dismissed from the university. Your study will get terminated. Your career has ended. So let us go through the scenarios and I will help you in the first few scenarios and then I would like to have some interaction from the audience. Professor Halawa. Yes. Would you please uh, click on the slideshow? Just to, yes. Is it all right now? It, it is all right. Thank you very much. Yeah. So scenario one, Mohammed has waited until the last minute to write his assignment on immunosuppression. He knows that his friend Nasser did the same assignment last semester and wrote a similar assignment. Mohammed took the final draft from Nasser. He changed it a bit. He wrote a new introduction, a new conclusion, was little rewarding to show that it is his own work, his own work. Submitted his assignment, 2010 reported 56% similarity. So what's the penalty for this? What grade, what category? Of course, this is category C. Penalty, fail, warning. University of Liverpool interested to teach you not to do it again. You will be given online tutorial. Actually, most, if not all the universities in the UK will do this. So, ended up by failing the assignment warning and he has a black point in his file. Scenario, uh, scenario two, Julia has been working on her assignment for module two, master degree in transplantation. By the way, I didn't have Julia on, on the master degree. <laughs> Neither. <laughs> she attended a webinar and got a few good ideas from this webinar. She wrote her ideas on the assignment. She gave it to her sister. She wasn't confident about her language. She thought it could be some grammatical mistakes. And this is why she gave it to her sister. Will you look at it? Yes, she did. She reworded a few sentences, corrected her grammar, gave it back to Julia. Julia submitted her assignment. Similarity index was 26%. Remember when we talked about the, the cutoff, it ranges between university, but nearly, nearly no, big, no big difference between, um, between them. So 26 is slightly high, it's borderline high. We have to remember as tutors, as examiners, we should, we should be guided, but not led by the software. 
because the software is a computer that does not think. It hasn't got a brain. The message here, the examiner also noticed differences in the writing style because you will never know that, you know, this, um, you know, the assignment being given to her sister. But the examiner noticed differences in writing style in two paragraphs. Difference in the font size and font style. So it must not be Julia. Based on this fact, what category at what penalty she will get? B, penalty in action, the final mark will be capped to 50% of the past mark because it is its first offense. Written warning, again, online tutorial. We are here not to penalize the students, not to put them off, but we teach them. They do mistakes, everybody does mistakes. You should learn from their mistakes. We should help them to learn from their mistakes. It's not a minefield. And this is how we learn. Scenario three, after making sure that he has used quotation marks and author tags to indicate the cited material within his paper, Ahmed forget to include parenthetical citation indicating page number. So minor error in referencing. He submitted the assignment, it's too late. The turn 10 reports a similarity in 19%. Professor Halawa, do you like them to the... the, the uh... No, no, uh, let me just get this scenario first. Yes. And then from, from the fourth, uh, you know, from scenario number four, we'll have an interactive, you know, okay. interactive discussion. Okay. This is category A, because minor mistakes, and it will be given verbal advice. He lost 10% of the final mark. Now, all of you think about it and give me an answer. Remember, nothing called wrong answer, but there is a better answer. Raj is stumped with his assignment for his transplant master. His friend Mohan is also taking the same assignment this semester, and he has done the assignment that Raj is currently struggling with. Mohan asked Raj for help. Raj, can I have a look at your assignment? Just to have an idea how I should write it. What happened, and this is not uncommon, Raj took Mohan's assignment, changed some words, only some words, moved some ideas around, turned it as his own assignment. He submitted the assignment. Similarity index, 60%. The software these days will identify where you have stolen these sentences, paragraphs from. So, Turn 10 indicated the similarity between Raj and Mohan. Fine. What's the penalty here? So, any answer?
would you please write on the chat if you if you'd like to write uh, so you can see the chat dr halawa where i can see the writing yes so there is category c category d so three, three, three choices, uh, three, uh, yes, yeah, C and D. A, A, B, C, D, E. <laughs> no, 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 it is C and D only. The choice is here, C or D. Uh, this is your opinion, yeah. No, no, this is a chat, not my opinion. Uh, I can see the chat, where is, where is yeah. the chat? This is it. Anyway. Uh, uh, um, uh, for some reason, I can't see it. So it is C or D. This is the choice. Yes. Of D. Okay. Yes, I agree. Oh. Yes, it's C. Fail. But what? What about Raj? Oh. Should he be penalized as well? Very interesting, Dr. Halaw. Let's just think together. What would you give both of them? David, have you got any thoughts? Dr. Muhammad Hadidi, please un unmute Dr. David. <clears throat> I, think, uh, I, think, I think, as, uh, as Professor Shaija said, it's, it's an interesting case. Um, we need to under, we need to understand by what intention did uh, Mohan share the assignment. We need to establish that first, and that would be part of the investigation. As for Raj, it's clearly a misconduct. It's his first attempt. We can't really establish whether or not it is intentional, but there is there is strong evidence. So Raj will definitely get C. As for Mohan. Uh, possibly would get a C for sharing the, the assignment unless we can identify, we can um, conclude without a shadow of a doubt that he, his intention was not um, to sell the information or to pass the information on. Yeah, uh, I think, you know, uh, uh, yeah, I'm thinking down the line, I agree with you, C or D for both of them, you know, but, you know, again, this demonstrates the penalty has to be severe. This demonstrates that even sharing the assignment, the one who shared the assignment, who gave, who gave the assignment, will be penalized as well. This is the bottom line. You're not making any favor to him, but actually you're damaging yourself as well. I would guess both of them will get D. You have good, excuse, excuse me, Professor Halawi, you have question here from uh, uh, Saadallah. Uh, Professor Halawi, is it le illegal to share the assignment prior to submission? Of course. No, it's not illegal. It's, you <laughs> of course. <laughs> yes, of course, yes. definitely. Yeah, and, and this is why the penalty, why we penalize, you know, those guys who are sharing the assignments. You're not doing any favor to education. You're not teaching him. You are helping him to steal. You're committing, basically, you're committing sin. And this is the rules of the universities of in, in UK. Uh, is a severe penalty ranges between C and D, but based basically there will be another helping factor whether he has committed this um you know uh, 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 um, uh, uh, mistake before or not can, can i jump in here sorry um the the way the way it's phrased in our regulations is if it's the first time then we cannot establish beyond shadow of a doubt that it wasn't then there's an intention to deceive so that's the wording that we use however if it's a repeated offense we can comfortably say that it was intentional to deceive. And then that becomes D. And the, um, the, penal, the penalty for D is uh, failing the whole module. Whereas in the penalty yes. for C is getting zero for this assignment. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's fair. 
fair, yeah. fair decision, yes. So sharing the assignment is not an innocent act. Scenario five. Jessica is researching on Gardasil. Gardasil is a polyvalent vaccine against human papilloma virus. She came across the following information on the medication's website. Gardasil is the only cervical cancer vaccine that helps protect against four types of HBV, human papilloma virus. Two types that cause 70% of cervical cancer cases, two more types that cause 90% of genital warts. Gardasil is for girls and women aged from 9 to 26. Gardasil.com. She decided, yes, very good information. She paraphrased it like this. God the seal is the sole cervical cancer vaccine that protects against four types of HBV and herpes. God the seal is for females between the age of nine and 26. There's a catch here. 2010 reports the similarity 44% as it picked up the references and the quotations. What's the penalty? Would you please write on the chat, yes? Uh, I don't know why Professor Chai, I can't see the, the chat. Okay, I can help you, no problem. I help you. So would you, would you please write, just write your opinion. So, so some, some of them said uh, no penalty, one C and the other innocent. So the, so, major yes. the majority no penalty. Penalty, okay. And, well, uh, and, here, think, and here for in the chat, not sure the why she should be penalized. She cited the website. We need yes or no answer, please. Yes, uh, don't ask, don't reply to a question by another. So no, so no. The, the majority of the chat answers are no. Yes, okay, agree. The oblique dress, it was rephrased and paraphrased and properly cited. What's wrong with that? References and quotations, if quoted properly, are excluded from the similarity report. Again, just you need to think about the figures and numbers provided by any software because it does not think. It's one of the glitches of any similarity check. Surprisingly, it wasn't it wasn't set up to exclude references and quotations. So you shouldn't take the percentage for granted. We should look why this 44%. By the way, quotation shouldn't exceed 20% of any written work. So we have to examine the assignment and examine the turn it in itself to make sure that it is fair. Scenario number six. After partying all week, Chris realized he hasn't done anything to prepare the draft for his paper on history of transplantation. He thought that he's very smart. After searching online, he found an obscure article from 1970s. Chris thought, oh, the examiner will never find it. And this software will never find it. It's an old 
article in an obscure journal, never heard of. He copied and pasted it. He copied and pasted the paper into his assignment. Table 10 reported similarity index of 90%. It was his first offense. What penalty? Okay, please write on the chat. So, the majority are D and the some C. It's very offense. It can't be D. So it is between D and the C. It, yes. It is C. Yes. But this will tell you that this plagiarism checker software has massive database, millions of articles, millions of websites. It will find it and we'll find you. So basically category C is first offense, 0% have failed assignment, written warning, and online tutorial. If repeated again, if repeated, he will get D and fail the whole module. Scenario seven. Nadia needed to add more information to her planned paper on CMV infection. She recently attended a lecture on CMV infection at international conference. During this lecture, she has taken some notes. She decided to use these notes in her paper. Since mostly most of his of her you know, uh, input were her own words taken during the lecture. She decided not to cite it. Turn 10, picked a similarity index of 31% because close link to the speakers to publish online. So which category A, B, C, D? Please write on the chat. They are between B and A. It can't be A, giving a similarity 31%. So B, poor referencing, as she did not cite the other authors. Again, we know the penalty, 50% off, it will be cut to 50%, warning, online tutorial. Scenario number eight, this is a very interesting scenario, and pay attention, Rubey. Jeff has collected several pieces of evidence about Vietnam War, or his paper. He did a very good job. He looked at newspaper articles, websites, describing the conflict in details before and after the war. You paraphrase it, reword it properly, cite it properly. And submitted his paper. Similarity index, 27% high. Because 2010, a software hasn't got a brain, does not think, picked up names, dates, and geographical places mentioned in Jeff's paper. Penalty? D. 
the majority are A. Only one or two are B. Okay, good. Thank you very much. None. Nobly dressed. Why? Because it's common knowledge. You can't change Cairo. You can't change the word Egypt. You can't change the year. You can't change Vietnam. You can't change the Second World War. These are common names, common knowledge. You don't require citation. Again, this is a role, there is a role for the examiner to filter this high similarity, to know why the similarity is high. Rather than blindly failing assignment or giving a penalty for 31%, however, he hasn't committed any crime or any mistake. And we'll discuss what common knowledge means later on. Scenario nine, Carol was busy arranging her wedding party. Congratulations, Carol. She forgot the deadline out for submission of the assignment. It is tomorrow. I haven't done a single, I haven't written a single word. She gave her friend Lisa a call asking for help. Lisa, very kind to Cairo, emailed her with, well, you know, with her assignment. Carol had already committed a category C lecturers before and received a written warning. She was given 0%, means she failed the assignment before and she was asked to resubmit her assignment. She had the online tutorial and the warning. In spite of the similarity, 18%, the examiner noticed similarity in the topic, writing style, ideas between Carol's and Lisa. So what do you think here? Okay. To be honest, you know, I made this scenario a bit, you know, harsh and worse because I want to address something. So the, the root D and one C and one D and B. I think well done, well done. But you know, but the similarity is 18%. Actually, the emphasis here on the examiner, we should pick up the intellectual similarity. There is intellectual plagiarism here between both of them. Yes, both D or D and C could be, of course, D for Carol and C for Lisa, or D for Carol and Lisa, um, or, or both of them D. So it's a major sin. Scenario number 10, Sam's assignment was reported to have 31% similarity. Most of the sentences highlighted by attorney 10 were common sentences like C9 is nephrotoxic, M2 induced proteinuria, kidney transplantation is the best renal replacement therapy. Penalty. Almost all selected nil. 
except one A. Well, well done. Noble address and common knowledge. Huh. Yes. Sentences do not require to be cited. How can I cite Cairo is the capital of Egypt? How can I cite London is the capital of the United Kingdom? And what's common knowledge here? I mean, this is actually very important. Do you think anything is common knowledge? Of course not. Common knowledge is knowledge that everybody knows. I cannot be disputed in the field relevant to the audience. But if you include information from a different field, you should cite it. Let me say I'm giving a talk about psychosporin nephrotoxicity to dentists. I should cite it because they're not aware of psychosporin, what's psychosporin, and what's nephrotoxicity. But if I'm giving the same talk to transplant clinicians, pharmacists, because David is here, I shouldn't cite it. It's common knowledge. If your reader might be surprised by your statement and question its accuracy or challenge it with, especially if we've got another data, it's not a common knowledge anymore. So it has to be black and white knowledge. No dispute about it. Also, one of the characteristics of common knowledge, if you Google it and you found that five scholarly so, you know, sources giving the same information is common knowledge. But this information, they are not contradicting each other. If they are if there are any contradic you know, contra contradiction, it's not common knowledge anymore. If you present data, figures, and numbers, it's not a common knowledge. It has, to, it has to be cited. Scenario 11, Adam is very busy with his private work hasn't got any time to write his assignment, he paid a third party to write his assignment. It's what we call it contract cheating. Huh. Other unfortunately he was doing very well. Never reported to commit plagiarism before. Turn it in or any plagiarism checker, report a similarity 63%. Not only that, the examiner reported poor quality scientific content, different writing style from what other used to submit before. Penalty, my colleagues, or shall we forgive him? No, they are writing, Dr. Halawa. Yeah, I'm just, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. I think it is a, a good, a good chair in the, in the chatting. So they are between C, D, and the E. E. So only one selected E. Yes. A second one here, E. So two E. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But again, this is something difficult to detect by software because, you know, the one who stole somebody's work or paid the work, paid to get his assignment, will never admit that he has done this work. Uh, 
realistically he will get saved. But he deserves e termination of his study and expulsion from the university. So let us have a brief chat about the contract cheating. Those who pay third party to write their work, the write their assignment. Believe me, it's not worth it. You will never get what you paid for. Usually low standard with high similarity. Come on, you know, it's, uh, you're doing something illegal. Do you think you will do it honestly? You do it right? You steal properly? No, they will plagiarize for you. They don't care about the quality. They stick words next to words, sentence next to sentence. It could be a language barrier, but it's our duty to educate them and teach them how to write in science. By the way, these weird websites, they present themselves in an innocent way, like student support service, student help, student advice, but it's a paid plagiarism. Fine, so let us change the scenarios a bit. What is the type of plagiarism and the category of the penalty here? Look carefully to the figures and numbers here. Is it a complete address copy and pasting the whole paper? Or is it patchy, type two, like paragraphs? Is it unintentional? Is it self? Any answer? Yes, they answered either patchy or A. Yeah, very close. Yes, patchy because the whole paragraph here, paragraphs. Yeah? And all these highlighted paragraphs, they are the plagiarized, the stolen paragraphs. Yes, it's B, yes. Complete paragraph, penalty, cap to 50% written warning and online tutorial. Fine, let us look at this. What's it, what is the type of plagiarism and category of the penalty? Uh, you know, I wanted to make it a bit easier for you. Notice the 19% similarity from submitted assignment to University of Liverpool there, over there. Remember that 24% is still below the cutoff, if you call it a cutoff. However, this cutoff is just a guide. They are writing, Dr. Halawa. Sure, sure. The majority are C, but there is one D and one A. None of them. <laughs> <laughs> it's B. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. 
complete paragraph again. Remember this, uh, you know, if you look at the similarity as a guide, it's 24%, it can't be complete. It's not the whole paper. It's not the whole assignment, it, you know, it was plagiarized. Just, you know, quarter of it. You might give it C, but, you know, most likely it will be, will be B. Right. Let's move on. Last time we discussed research. We discussed the importance of negative results. We discussed the importance of being honest with your data. You should not manipulate your data by all means to get positive results. You harm your career. You damage the an institute. You may get penalized. You may go to jail. Dr. A.S. was researching on the effect of streptococcin induced diabetes. I was looking at the upregulation of a process marker, collagen 3, collagen 4, TGF beta, and rad partial nephrectomy model. It was working very hard. He has performed 21 laboratory experiments, recorded them accurately. He used an inappropriate statistical test to give significant results. He knew very well that the appropriate test would not give him a significant result. The p-value is not, not 0.5. Is it fabrication, falsification? And if you are the examiner, what would you do? So the data is essentially non-parametric. And when I use non-parametric tests like Man Whitney, the results, the, no significant values, nothing significant. But when I use student t-test or parametric, Give me a significant results. I presented my thesis. Oh yeah, I got significant results, positive results. What would happen to this guy? So the majority, the majority wrote falsification, and he should fail. Well done. Yes, falsification, penalty, fail the viva. He has to rewrite his thesis using the appropriate statistical test, and resubmit. So another six months of delay, embarrassment, and declared cheating. Scenario 15, Dr. XY presented the results of Western blot analysis. Western blot analysis, we use it to uh, quantify the protein deposition in the kidney tissue. How much collagen three protein been laid down, collagen four, TGF beta. However, the test was not performed. He presented the data of all other experiments which were confirmed by his supervisor. It's not unusual, remember, it's not unusual to be asked to present your raw data and the, and the lab record of all experiments you have done. Fine, so penalty, what would you do? Will you award him the PhD? Will you fail him? Will you send him thank you letter?
Okay, they wrote fail, e, fail, e. <laughs> so they, yeah, are, yeah, yeah. they are aggressive. <laughs> Hang on a second. Yes. By the way, you know, all data presented were true data except the Western plot test, which was not done. Will you fail him because of this? Asadullah is. Hmm. And, of, and, course, uh, I will uh, fail. of course, I failed him. Uh, yeah, this is fabrication. Fail the thing, fail the driver. It's a plenary procedure dismissed from the university. After three years of hard work, because he fabricated a test. His career ended. If he didn't do the Western blot and didn't present it, he could have awarded the degree. This is the wrong scenario. Dr. Zy was researching on the effect of cyclosporin on upregulation of fibrosis marker, messenger RNA, collagen 3, collagen 4, TG beta, protein depositions using Western blot and immunostochemistry, and proteinuria and rat model of ischemia reperfusion injury. He had two sets of the two groups, 130 minutes, 160 minutes. Honestly, this guy did serial level of sex sporin. Sample size actually was comparable to published uh, papers and reports. He used appropriate statistical tests. Very clear methodology. He found no effect after seven days, no upregulations of all these fibrosis markers after seven days and after 30 days. It was disappointing because a paper came up a month before his submission showed that these fibrosis marker were upregulated after 45 days. So he used seven days and 30 days. So if he has waited a bit longer, he could have positive results. He provided a scientific justification for the difference between his work and the published report. The time frame is different, difference in rat model, the duration of ischemia, so on. Will you award him the degree? What negative results? You may say, oh, why he didn't do it after 45 days? So all of them uh, said, yes, he is honest. This is the word, well done, excellent and honest work awarded the degree with distinction. But the problem was negative results. He struggled to publish the work. Publish the work at the end. You know, it took him a while. Because it's not his fault, it's a publisher's fault. Usually interested to publish positive results. Just at the end, I would like just to ask you a question. Is medicine entirely based on randomized controlled trials? If my study was not randomized, not controlled, not a trial, is a rubbish study? So um, if, you like, if you like me to, to comment, because- No, 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 I want them to comment, you know, if you don't mind, Professor. Yes, okay, they, they wrote no. Because, you know, I want you to comment after that. 
they wrote no. So the, the majority of them said it is not rubbish to have observational study and uh, uh, medicine is not entirely based on RCTs. Excellent. What's your comment, Professor Shaisha? I agree with them because yes. sometimes it is extremely difficult to, to do randomized control trial. And there is uh, uh, an example uh, which is known as parachute study. Sometimes it's impossible to uh, do randomized interventional study. Um, even in, uh, in nephrology, if you ask me if there is evidence A for doing dialysis for patients who have uh, pulmonary edema or severe hyperkalemia, the answer is no. Why no? Because we cannot do randomized control trial leaving patients to be treated conservative and living because the patient may die. So in this it's scenario, unethical. Yes, yes, it is unethical to do randomized control trial. So yeah. if, yes. if, we, if we can do a randomized control trial, it is the best because it is interventional and it is without selection bias, ATC, but sometimes it is impossible to be conducted. Like proving harm for cancer, if we smoke, I cannot do randomized control study allowing patients to smoke and others to eat uh, banana. It is impossible because it will. <laughs> <laughs> so, so if I can do randomized control trial, yes, it is the best, but sometimes it is impossible. And obser observational studies are interesting in itself because it carries hypothesis to be tested if we can in randomized control study. I, I agree a million times. Actually, most of the evidence we use are not based on, our, on, on, on randomized control trials. Yes, as you, as you mentioned, to withhold a life-saving treatment like dialysis versus banana. <laughs> 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 or oh, it's not a placebo control, come on. You know, it's very unethical. You can't conduct the study. You stop bleeding versus you give him paracetamol. Rare diseases, it can't be randomized. Long term effect 10 years and, and longer. You know, cannot, cannot conduct it as a randomized control trial. Yes. The study is based on the registry data and so on. So most of the medicine is based on non-randomized, non-controlled, even non-trials. And there's, yeah. there, is, there is common sense in some situations. So I cannot do randomized control trial to test if I deal the, with the patients in a nice way, it will be positive for their um, satisfaction. I, I cannot uh, classify patients into two groups, one group treated by harsh way and other groups by <laughs> gifts. Uh, yeah, it's impossible. From ethical point of view, and we have Dr. Tudora with us, it is completely yeah. unethical. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. My point here is, your honest and hard work, even if not randomized, not controlled, and not even a trial, is a, layer, is a real life medicine. It's day-to-day -day medicine. If well designed, well explained, well written. Because I have seen, there are a few papers, you know, recently, randomized, hang, hang on a second, it's not randomized. Control is not control. If it's not a trial. So you don't need to present your research as randomized. If not, and controlled. If not, you get penalized for this. Because the other form of research work very well and get good information, helps science improve the quality of life. Research is not based on randomized control trials. However, they are the best, but not always feasible. It costs a lot, a lot of effort. If you allow me, Professor Halawa, just to add one sentence here. Uh, randomized control trial is the best to prove drug efficacy and safety but it is not the best to prove harm. And if harm is captured from a randomized control trial, it is the high degree of harm to be accredited and to be accepted as, uh, uh, and to be convinced by the degree of harm. But it is impossible to run a study 
for the sake primary aim is to prove harm. And the, if I wanted to assess drug efficacy, I should have randomized control trial. And to reach a randomized control trial by drug safety and efficacy, it has a long process starting from animal to phase one ATC. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Fine. So uh, in terms of academic writing, because I just touched on academic writing, I recommend uh, this free course is free. Uh, and actually, you will discover that no one is perfect academic writer, but there's always room for improvement. Also provided you with free copies, not pirate copies, by the way. Already, you know, you can download them, you know, from, from Google. Helps you to understand how to write medicine in a very simple, easy way. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Halawa, for this extremely valuable uh, presentations through uh, these two weeks. It really enriched our mind. And I think we have uh, the software for uh, plagiarism in our university, but I think we don't apply the rules as you apply in the University of Liverpool. So we, we will uh, work on this point because if we are strict in these issues and starting from the early beginning, from the first days of medical school, it will make a great difference. Thank you very much and hoping to have some comments for five or two, 10 minutes and then to shift to Dr. Tudora talk. I'd like to start with Dr. David. Dr. David, please. Dr. Hadidi, please unmute him. Um, okay. <clears throat> All right, so um, a couple of things. Um, just wanted to pick on uh, what Professor Halawa said about the necessity for academic judgment. So a lot of the time we you get very low uh, similarity score, and you, but then you have a feel that something is wrong going on. So you would dig deep and you would um, sort of investigate it and then you see what was picked up and, and you see what the similarities are and then you can make an academic judgment that way. Um, also, um, when it comes to paraphrasing stuff, uh, I mean, if we, we, the course we run is an, at an MSc level, so we expect people to, pre, to be producing things in their own, um, from their own understanding, to be synthesizing knowledge, which, uh, which means that if, if an assignment, even though it might not be plagiarized, however, it would impact our academic judgment because we will see this assignment because a lot, the, if a lot of it is paraphrased from um, other resources, it does not tell us much about the student's understanding or the student's analysis or evaluation. So that would impact our, our, um, our academic judgment, that would impact how we mark it. So we would, would receive, it would be penalized academically, even though it's not penalized because of plagiarism, but it's penalized because academically, the student is not demonstrating the level of understanding that we expect from them because they have chosen to um, paraphrase someone else's work rather than produce their own work. They are not reflecting, yes. They are not making their own ideas, that, yes, absolutely. Yeah, and, and so what, what I'm trying to say is, it's a good skill to be able to um, read something and uh, read multiple resources and put them together from your own understanding and analyze and evaluate and critique and contrast the stuff that you're reading to ensure that um, whatever you're producing at the end is your own work and is of good quality. Um, it's, not, it's not a natural skill, it's a skill that's gained. So that's why um, the academic writing courses, such as the one Professor Halawa recommended, are very useful. Um, they will give you an idea of how to approach um, uh, an essay and, and write it appropriately. Um, when, when we use um, plagiarism uh, analysis software, I mean, all, all, all it does is basically it looks through whatever has been submitted previously and all the work on the internet and then compares it and then gives us a score of similarity. Um, so that does not, um, so, so even, if you, even if students use that to check their own work before they submit it, yeah, may, they may be able to identify ways of overriding the system. However, that does not, give them the writing skills that they need. And that would not enable them to make the most out of the feedback that's provided academically. 
Um, I have seen um, assignments which were bought or um, uh, in a, in a, not admittedly not in Liverpool in a previous job that I've had. Um, assignments that were bought. And as Professor Halawa said, the quality was very poor. In fact, I'm, I'm willing to bet if the student tried had to go at the assignment themselves, they would have probably got a better mark. Um, so if, because the, the, the main aim of assignments or the main aim of assessments academically is to improve your skills as well as to, for, for academics to see the level that you're at. Um, I would try to refrain from sort of going to taking the easy way out and I'll try to produce, our, my, to produce the work yourself because that will give you the skills and the training you need and the enable and give you the opportunity for, for, the, for, you, for, your, for the faculty to give you the feedback that you would need to improve your writing and to write better, which you know, would only spring board you to success because it will give you the skills that you need to write things that can be published later on, etc. Thank you very much, Dr. David, for uh, these valuable comments. And Dr. Professor Said Khamis, uh, yes, please. Good evening, Dr. Halawa. Thanks for your elegant uh, talk. Uh, just I would like to ask uh, if you remember a uh, couple of weeks ago, uh, the famous uh, paper uh, retracted from the Lancet. Uh, my question, uh, what, who is guilty in this, uh, regarding this article? The authors, the editors, and under what category you will vote and what penalty should be there? Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Saeed. It is very nice. Point. Yes, uh, let's just think about it together because we don't have the full information. But what I know is they submitted the paper to uh, Lancet and the Lancet asked, as far as I remember, correct me if I'm wrong, can we check the raw data? Can we see the analysis? They refused to give the raw data to them. Is it right? I think yeah, yeah. I think so, yes. Yes. There was so a, th a, third, a third party uh, which raised the, the, uh, a notice and then uh, uh, they asked the, the authors for the original data and I think there was a problem. So the, the, the paper was retracted. So basically, uh, lack of the raw data because, you know, the, the, the work presented created a lot of issues and, uh, you know, a lot of conflicts. Uh, you know, defeated the purpose of the article. So basically, that this what happened. There is no. I don't think there will be a fine, because you know there is no evidence to support that this guy committed the sin. But it's obviously, he is he dis, you know dishonest. Obviously, he dishonest. But you need to have a strong evidence. You suspect that he committed, uh, you know, um, um, a, a crime, and. What do you think, you know, uh, Professor Hussein? What do you think, David? It was you know? brave. It was brave from the journal because the Lancet is a very prestigious journal. Uh, with this is very not. high. Yes, when the ranking is the first uh, journal. So the if they uh, uh, examine some work and there is a suspicion of the uh, uh, of the data of the accuracy of the data, I think the the uh, editor in chief was brave to retract the article. And they wrote uh, some points about this because the article was very impressive about complications of hydroxychloroquine. I, I no, yes. yes. Yeah. And it, it, um, it was very striking for all physicians uh, to stop hydroxychloroquine altogether because of uh, a very high yeah. percentage of complication. So it changed the, even the practice of physicians uh, based on uh, this paper and the the journal rank, so yes, I think the, the journal, journal the journal is okay. But if it is repeated every now and then, I think the rank of the journal will be uh, uh, reduced. But do you think the journal had the right to you know prosecute you know the author? Yes, I, I don't. You know, I think they have the right to prosecute him. Yes, because there is some exa There is, uh, I think, there was a remote oh. example of uh, uh, the researcher who invented vaccine against HIV. Mm. And they found that when, when another center wants to um, revalidate the results by repeating the experiment, they found nothing. So at the end of the day, there was, uh, there was very uh, high penalty for the authors and everything. So yes, even I think the, 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 the author was not American. 
but uh, he had a nationality, American nationality, and they, they uh, omit the nationality and asked him to leave the United States and to uh, uh, re repay the money again. <laughs> so, 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 so he lost everything, nationality <laughs> and money. <laughs> Dr. David, Dr. David Belize. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think I agree. I think it's brave of the journal to 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 take that step. Um, you know, it's the Lancet. The Lancet need to protect their reputation. So yes, if if they have suspicion and they don't act on it, in fact, we would be we would be questioning the Lancet, and we'd be expecting the Lancet to have done something about it. Yeah, but I think if it is repeated frequently, the editor in chief will be changed. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> 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 okay, there is here. There is a question in the chat. Uh, some uh, prestigious journals offer bid rewriting of accepted paper to enhance uh, grammar and level of wording. Don't uh, don't you think this is a double treatment? Uh, sorry, journal, I, didn't, I didn't. I didn't get the question. If the, the journal, journal, if the journal offer money. Uh, to improve the writing of the article, to be published in the journal. Is it ethical or it is problem? Uh, hang on a second. I mean, there is, you know, many journals, many journals have an uh, academic editor. But you need an academic e uh, editor, which you basically will, will just uh, fine tune uh, the language, not to rewrite it. You, when you submit an article, should be academically right, scientifically right, to the best of your knowledge. And this, um, you know, uh, um, uh, English editor, they will just fine tune the language. It's not rewriting it. We cannot rewrite an article for you. If you are talking about submission fees, many journals, you know, ask for submission fees because of the, the you know, the process of printing, the process of editing, all this process, it costs a lot of money, especially, you know, uh, you know journals with high impact factors. Professor Mahmoud Hamada, uh, do, do you like to uh, add uh, any statements? Yes, Dr. Hussein, my sound is okay. It's okay, very nice. Go ahead. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ahmed, for the nice lecture and the part one and part two. Uh, when we are submitting some papers to prestigious journals after reviewing, uh, the first uh, decision is the, letter, the paper is accepted, but then they offer to rewrite. As you said, it's fine tuning, but according to them, it's, um, let's say it's debate and the, the, the fees is high. Not fees for, uh, for processing, but fees for rewriting itself. So I think this is typical for one of the scenarios you mentioned when the uh, author tried to enhance the grammar of her uh, Sister. academic paper. Mm. So I think it's uh, some kind of double treatment, actually. It, it, you know, it become a business. You know, these journals, they're making a business yes. rather than helping science. Yes, yes. You know, uh, to be honest, it's a lot cheaper to write it yourself first time right. We are trying to do our best, Dr. Ahmed, but sometimes mm. the language is, yeah, sometimes. No, language shouldn't be a problem. It's just, you know, writing uh, medical English is not that difficult. It's our perception is difficult. Just we need to know the rules and regulations. You need to write more articles, yes, you okay. know, uh, to get the experience. Yes. It, 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 uh, you know, I don't find it difficult. But, but my, my uh, gut feeling regarding this point, it is not 100% uh, ethical. Because the, there is a conflict, yes, it is. A, there is a conflict of interest here. The journal accepted the article, and so you paid if, for it. if if wanted to make some improvement and enhancing the writings, okay, to help the authors. Otherwise, he can shift the attention before acceptance for the article to be uh, reviewed from native English speaking or writer. Uh, but not to, to be paid to the journal for the sake of improving writing. Am I right, Professor Halal? Absolutely. And the funny thing is, you know, um, you know, in, in many situations, actually happened in the past, once I think, I think once or twice, when I send an article, uh, 
the editor sent to me a comment that you know the, you know, the language needs improve is better to uh, uh, ask the help seek the help of native English speaker all right when I saw the feedback is full of mistakes yeah and poor English I replied back by correcting his feedback and I asked him will you find you know somebody else to write your feedback because you're not a good writer so there is a bias here when they see a strange name they might ask for review or be harsh in you. Okay, B B Professor Faisal Shaheen. Yes, uh, good evening. I enjoy again, uh, Prof. Halawa, your talk very much. And I learned a lot actually today from the communication and the, the answers of your uh, questions. Uh, my, I have just a simple question. Maybe you said it during your talk and I didn't get it. If, we, if someone looking for old publications, which have been accepted uh, 10 years back or 14 year, years back before having such software, which can discover any playground, uh, is this ethical or it is not to be done or, uh, or it can be done? All right, uh, what do you mean, uh, uh, Professor Shaheen, to look back at all published work and see whether it's been plagiarized or not? Yes. Is it right? Yes, old one. Old ones. Uh, I this, don't think this what know, happened with us, uh, Professor Halawa, excuse me. Uh, this, this occurred frequently with us when we uh, introduce our CV for a, uh, an award. Uh, the, uh, I should introduce with the award the plagiarism percentage for uh, the pub already published articles. And in the award committee, if they found high plagiarism, this is a negative point against the award for research. This is- uh, No, no, but actually, Professor Shane uh, meant that, you know, if we look back uh, to the published work 10, 20 years ago and see whether it's been plagiarized or not. But this is a, you know, a, an, an effort consuming and time consuming, yeah. prof, you know, what's think, published is published. Uh, no need. Don't forget, plagiarism and academic dishonesty was not that popular at that time. You know, we perceived it wrong in the school, um, you know, but we start to learn about it in the, in, in the university and becomes implemented, you know, in the, in the last 10 years or something. So um, what happened in the past, like, you know, uh, like war crimes in the past. So, um, you know, let us learn from it. This is what I think. Let us learn from it and not to do it and prevent, you know, plagiarism, you know, and teach the student properly not to happen and give them an example from the past. Okay. The last comment to Dr. Yasser El Mullah. Excellent talk as usual, uh, Prof. Halawa, and nothing to add, to be honest. Okay. Many thanks for the great talk. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Halawa, for this exciting, uh, really very wonderful two uh, meetings. Thank you very much, and I think it's time to move to Dr. Tudora because uh, I, um, she waited a lot, uh, a long time. Okay, Dr. Tudora, please. Uh, please, Professor Halawa, stop the sharing the screen. Stop sharing, uh, sharing from your side. Yes, Dr. Tudora. Um. Yes, please, chair your first, slide. First, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me again. It is um, really um, a pleasure to, um, to be it is, here. It is, it, it, the pleasure is to us because uh, we feel that you are unique in your uh, character and humbling and as well as expert in the, in the ethics and you enriched uh, the, our meetings. So um, it is, uh, our pleasure and honor to have you with us. Dr. Tudora, please. Thank you, Thank you so much. So uh, when Professor Halawa asked me to say something about you know, plagiarism or research misconduct, I, I, I felt like uh, he covered the topic so well and in so many details that it's, it's not so much left there for me. So then I had, I had two ideas, either to um, um, present to you like a history of plagiarism, which is quite interesting because it started with a poet, a Latin poet, uh, Marsha, who um, uh, called pledges what mean kidnapping, like he felt like someone was kidnapping his verses, his idea. 
um, and they, they, are, they are beautiful stories um, in this line as well. But I, I choose to talk about something else, um, and this is research and uh, politics and research misconduct. Um, and it, all, it was already, in a way, introduced uh, before, uh, because you talked about, for example, journals and policy, um, and you talk about companies and pressure, you know, to, to come with a vaccine or to, to come with a solution. You talk about randomized clinical trials and how, um, you know, a certain image of what medicine is or what medicine should be. Um, it's um, uh, put in a society. So now what I um, wanted to, uh, to say is that um, science is actually a social, a culture and a political practice. So we, we often uh, think about science like something totally isolated, but it is social, it is culture, it is political. Um, and I would like to insist on uh, those aspects. So. Um, I, I would uh, say that so far, um, uh, Professor Halawa talked about research misconduct at the individual level. And this is the, the first framework, if you like, to talk about the individual morality, where we analyze uh, value like honesty, integrity, truthfulness, and so on. And I will, I will move towards um, two um, other um, aspects. Um, and those, those are, the microculture, which is peer pressure or institutional interest, and politics, which is actually instrumentalization of science for other purposes. Um, so now, if I can, um, sorry, I am, okay. So um, the, the microculture, I give an example here, the pharmaceutical in industry. And uh, there is a corporate behavior, for example, ignoring sometimes ethical boundaries. Uh, it is a business, has uh, the idea of profit and competition. And there are lots of examples, for example, regulation, drug approval processes and institution, clinical trials, and the fact that not all clinical trials have to be uh, disclosed or published and of course the protection of human participants. Um, and we talk about regulation standards. Are they trustworthy? Are they global standards and so on? And they, they try actually to regulate interactions. Um, they, they have different patent uh, rules and there is strategic knowledge. Um, and all of that is regulated by different state and health institution, by market actors, by intellectual property rights. Uh, but of course, you need to talk about fair drug prices, and we will have that soon, I hope, uh, with, the, with the COVID drugs and so on. Um, but, you know, you need to think about that as a business, and you need to think what happens if you are, for example, employed by, by those pharmaceutical companies. Um, I have um, uh, a little story I, I used to teach um, back in Exeter. Uh, pharmaceutical cultures and I dig up a few examples that I like very much and this is um, a history of, of contraceptives and hormone development. Um, you might have um, already uh, know about that, uh, I suppose when, when you study medicine you, you, you learn about that, but I, I find it very interesting to frame it in this way. So uh, in 1930s the structure of steroid hormones was analyzed and then they discovered the connection between um, them and um, inhibiting ovulation. So initially the animal extract, very, very expensive. Um, and however, in 1939, they moved towards the plant extracts and um, towards the plant uh, steroids. And that was uh, 1944, uh, so Russell Markham, um, he co-founded Scientex, and um, um, the steroids were extracted from the Mexican yam called Barbasco. And the whole, uh, the whole process, uh, it's illustrated actually in a book, it was called the Barbasco Trades. Uh, that was the beginning of steroids industry. Uh, and again, here, it, it's, as I said, this, this, this beautiful book published in 2005, uh, where Scientex broke the monopoly of European farm on steroids hormones and there were lots of exchanges between uh, USA and Mexico because that, that, um, this plant was discovered in, in Mexico and then imported to the USA. Um, that, for example, changed the, the price of progesterone. However, 
what was interesting was used to treat arthritis, eczema, and diabetes. And um, the development of, of contraceptives was seriously delayed because nobody was interested on studying contraceptives, on you know, creating contraceptives. So there was no interest from pharma, from university, from governments. Um, they were, um, there was uh, this, this woman, Margaret Sanger, um, and she and others tried to, uh, you know, push that, but as I said, there was no interest to, to pursue that. However, contraceptives were later um, discovered, and interesting enough, the trial was done in Puerto Rico in 1950s. Um, so the patients were illiterate, not English-speaking women, poor, they had to be under 40, already two children in good health. Uh, there's no awareness of side effects, no, inter no information, and the, the side effects were, were just awful. Um, you can see here nausea, bloating, depression, and uh, three deaths. Of course, there are no autopsies, and those were uh, not um, reported because this time they're interested to, um, you know, to put those things on, on the market. So. Um, another another case, much more recently, and I I witnessed this case in a in a very very strange way. Um, it's about Vioxx, and uh, you know that it doubles the risk of heart attack and stroke. So that was all, um, withdrawn from the market in September 2004, uh, but after five years of use, and uh, approximately 20 million of people had used it. So. How by by the time I set up the first biotic masters in in Romania in um, a city in the north called Yash, and uh, my students who were um, uh, already working um, as as young doctors and GPs, they told me actually about the Viax, and they told me that this pharma company uh, gave them the pills to prescribe to patients, together with kind of diaries they have to complete and then return to the company. And there were numerous deaths in Yash. So one of my students chose to actually write a dissertation of that. And she later uh, went to the United States for further studies in, in biotics and so on. So I was kind of, um, you know, witnessing um, this, um, this thing uh, on, uh, on real life. Um, there are here some, uh, there are publication about that, um, and there were uh, that causing, uh, Vioxx was causing uh, death, and uh, there were lots of problems with New England Journal of Medicine, where the, the article was submitted, but, you know, the editor fails to respond, um, and so on. So you, you can see here, I will not read you the whole, um, uh, you know, the whole fragment, you can have the presentation later uh, if you like, but it's again editorial policies and so on that um, impacts in those results. Um, maybe by now with the development of bioethics, everybody know about the Tuskegee study that was uh, conducted in America. Um, over 40 years, um, there was this study on untreated syphilis in um, African American. Uh, so it started actually in 1932 um, and ended in 1972 and actually was stopped by a whistleblower. Otherwise, maybe it would have continued. So um, the aim was to observe the natural causes of untreated syphilis. So basically, although penicillin was available to treat them, uh, they are not properly treated. Um, so the consequences of, of this case were um, gigantic because it was the, in 1979 was the uh, Belmont report and um, that is how uh, the bioethics was actually established and patient rights and so on. So it was, uh, was very important for ethics, but imagine 40 years of experimenting on, on those poor people. Um, and it took until 1997 for the state to apologize. So what I want to say is that experiments here, you know, were, were conducted in a totally unethical way. And it's it's hard to say that what the, the scientists, or maybe it was something else. So politics can very easy instrumentalize science for other purposes. And um, there is a thing called Lysakonist, 
which is the, the science used for political ideological aims. It happens in um, Soviet Russia with this guy, uh, Lysenko, Lys Lysenko, I think. And he was, um, he rejected the mainstream biology for some reason, Stalin liked him very much. Um, and um, what, uh, what he did because, you know, because of him, um, lots of normal biologists doing honest work were actually um, imprisoned. Some, lots of them executed by, by Stalin because they were opposed to uh, Lysenko's methods. Um, so this is a, a case of strong control when the um, government um, intervene, you know, to, to mute uh, or to remove inconvenient science. Um, but uh, there are other forms of mild control where uh, funding is allocated for certain research areas. And if you, if you think about this, so um, I don't know, let's say you have an interest of um, developing, um, you know, to, to do a research project on kidney transplant, but you will hear that's not a priority. Now everybody has to study dementia or, um, you know, the, the governmental funding is only for certain other diseases than yours. So then automatically, if you are not funded, you, you cannot develop your science. So that is another factor that impacts um, on your research. Um, historical example for using science, uh, the, the Nazi experiment, um, you are aware of them, so they were actually doing transplantation, bone muscles and I think nerves in, in Ravensburg, um, studies on twin and so on. Um, the idea of Arianism was presented by the time as being scientifically based and it was originated in what was considered to be the last hour uh, science in the 19th century. Um, so Arthur de Gobineau, he wrote an essay on um, inequality of the human races. Uh, then Charles Morris about the Aryan race and um, he uh, launched this idea of dolicocephaly, the idea of the long skull and then um, um, later uh, Vachet de la Ponte a uh, French guy, he wrote about um, the social role of the Aryan. And then he had this um, very interesting theory. They are dolicocephals, people, and blonde, which are natural leaders, and they are destined to rule over more brachycephalic people, so short skulled people. Um, so if you see here, that was used actually by empires for justification of their domination, why they should invade other nations because they have larger skulls. And so they have to dominate the ones with uh, slightly smaller skulls. Uh, that was considered to be, as I said, scientific evidence by the time. Um, so um, another, another comment about the, the color of skin, the Santo Croix, the fair skin Europeans and Melano Croix, so the darker, uh, Mediterranean people and so on. Now, from all of this, what I want for medical students, I want them to, to know that healthcare researcher and professional are actually under political pressure regarding academic career, funding, resources. Are medical students prepared for it? Could they, you know, keep their integrity? Could, can they keep their values in this, um, either in microcultures or, you know, when politics might, might intervene? And I think that medical ethics should be rigorously implemented in uh, medical education. Um, and, you know, they, they should be ethics experts in healthcare structure, uh, healthcare and uh, in healthcare structure that can support an environment of trust, independence, and honesty. And this is why, uh, together with my colleagues, and I was very happy to see David here uh, this evening, um, we tried to, to set up a new program, uh, will be called Global Medical Ethics. Um, so far, we managed two modules, uh, and they will run from um, this September. Um, so we try, we try to introduce ethics and to make it strong in a practice of medicine, um, to allow, as I said, a better culture and to allow for um, individuals to uh, develop in a very nice and harmonious way. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Tudora, for this very exciting presentation.
I agree with you 100%. Ethics uh, lies in the heart of medicine. And uh, always there is, there is a problem with the drugs. So we should be cautious when we prescribe medicine for the patients. Sometimes the patient deteriorated and we assume that deterioration is the natural history of the disease and it's because of the polypharmacy we use. So I, I think there is a very nice quotation and I, I, uh, uh, I expect that Professor Halawa know it. The, uh, a good doctor treat uh, disease with many drugs, but great doctor treat many diseases with a single drug. So the lower the drug to use, it, the better to be, uh, for the performance. And uh, using drugs is common cause of death all over the world. It, because doctors assume that the disease is worsening, increasing drug and drug may be fatal. And there is very pressure from the political side in every country all over the world because this is big business after arm is the drug. So um, I think this is the, your courses in ethics uh, are fundamental uh, to build the physicians how to face the dilemma of ethics. Now, Dr. Professor Halawa and, uh, and Dr. David. Professor Halawa. I'd say I've, um, you know, nothing to add, but um, ethic is, you have to be all conscious about ethics and we we'll ask ourselves first question, what I'm doing, is it ethical or not? Writing an assignment, writing a paper, dealing with the patients, prescribing medicine, so everything is ethics is, is, is you know, uh, is the building block of our practice, our life, our dealing with others as well, our relationship. So we can't have ethics. You can't, you know, ignore Tudora. It's <laughs> 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 in every aspect in our life, our practice, our profession. <laughs> I think the choices of uh, management is, is based on ethics and another axis is the patients are aware nowadays, even in the in developing countries, the biomedical legal aspects. So ethics uh, are fundamental for us phys as physicians, we should know ethics and we should know the law as well, because both of them are essential for us to work in a, in a safe manner. But can I just add yes, please. One, one, single, one single thing? So as, as you know, I work as an ethics expert for the, for the European Commission where I assess mm -hmm. grant, grant proposal, uh, most of the medical, you know, that's what the ethical problems is. And I notice actually something extraordinary happening over the time. You know, you, you have in medicine something that is called incidental findings. Yeah. Um, I think they were initially discovered in radiology, so where, where things start to appear and so on. Now, believe me or not, but you believe me, social sciences, if you have a project in social sciences, in sociology, or you go to interview someone, you have to have a policy for incidental findings. So this one, which was a medical concept once, uh, crossed the border the other way around. So what I want to say is not ethics preaching to the medicine, it's medicine teaching the ethicist about new things and integrated that in a social science discourse. Because, you know, you interview someone who was, I don't know, an emigrant or in a war zone and so on, or, you know, witnessing a criminal activity and you find you have incidental findings. But, you know, the thing is that the, the ethical awareness, the ethical sensitivity for that was discovered in medicine. Uh, and, you know, I read the book years ago and that changed totally my perception. They said, you know, ethicist, you should not stay in your tower. You should go to the hospital because that's where you learn. That's where ethics come from. And I have this idea. That's the whole um, base of this project that we go to the bedside. We discover the ethical problems there. Yes, we debate. We have the discourse and we know all the intricacy of ethical arguments. But I like real problems because you know doctors deal with real problems patients deal with real problems you know this is, no, this right. is you uh, yes. ethics the Brian, i have i have a question here which is actually it's nice you know um I, i'm trying try to, to be just be you know not to uh, disclose any identifiable information a patient came to transplant and then you know already admitted 
to the world and kidney ready for, you know, for this patient. Just before the operation, we were informed that this patient hasn't got any residence status. Oh. Visa expired, no residency, basically not entitled to UK treatment. What we did is we turn our eyes blind as if we haven't heard anything, we haven't seen anything, the whole team, and we proceeded with the, with the operation. Um, do you think it would be unethical if we cancelled? This is what we thought. It's very unethical to cancel the procedure, the transplant or the operation because of residency, because of the visa. Well, you know... What do you think? Well, when you finish medicine, I don't know how, how you see a bias course is the same. You have to swear, you have a Hippocratic oath, do you? I never That's, did, but I will. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, in theory, I yeah. Mean, even, <laughs> even if you don't do that, the main, your main vocation for studying medicine is to help people. Absolutely, yes. It's not to discriminate. I don't need to, you know, to give the oath, you know, to the, yeah. You know, it's not to discriminate between citizens. If you have this patient on a table and you have the kidney there, it's, I think it, it passes the point where you but, have but, to make decisions. Because so that excuse should me, be Dr. Tudora, excuse me, Dr. Tudora, the patient was not on the table, the, the, the process of transplantation, or uh, because I Just think- Just a few hours before the table. Uh, yeah, this, this is a real problem because you can be confronted with the law and the management policy of the place. Um, uh, so how to solve this problem, I don't know. But what I want to say is that if, if you know other, other instances, other, you know, the, to, to enter hospital, you have reception, you have GPs, mm -hmm. you have, you know, people to do the referrals. It's not fair, you know, because a surgeon needs to do his job as a surgeon. He do not have to take those decisions because that's, that's, that's not in his field, in my, in my opinion. That is the, the job of administration. That is the job of policy. How do you know that, for example, someone else is not doing an application and two hours later this person has the citizenship? It's not his business. If, if the patient is so advanced in a process, for me, it's unhuman and unethical not to treat this patient. And, you know, the thing is, in a way, for me, it's, it's very simple what ethics is about. Ethics is, when I go to bed, can I put my head on a pillow and sleep? Like... Yeah that's the last day of my life, or I cannot. <laughs> so it depends upon the power of the management system. So the, the director of the hospital can say, the shot, the patient. Yeah, no, actually, to be honest, you know, to be honest, you know, uh, we decided as if we didn't know, yeah? uh, and we proceeded, and even we never, we never had a word with the patient okay. at all. I think it is. Yeah. So it's, she got equivalent to uh, 25,000 pounds worth of uh, 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 of service uh, but uh, again you know exactly what Tudora said do you think I put my head at the you know on the pillow at night and I feel comfortable you know if I you know cancel the operation so it, it, it even before Hippocrates the it, the um, Confucius the Chinese Confucius who settled the ethics of, uh, of medicine since uh, antiquity, uh, he puts the word self-examination. So this is a, this self, if we examine ourselves, blaming ourselves about the behavior, I think it will be straightforward to do operation. But uh, you can be confronted by administration. The, if the director of the hospital discharges the patient, the patient is discharged, but I'm not going to discharge him. I won't tell him. Yeah. I wouldn't tell them. <laughs> okay, it's, it's perfect. So uh, uh, before uh, the mic to go to Dr. David, I'd like to hear from uh, Professor Haim al -Aghan. Professor Haim al is uh, one of the very uh, senior, it, uh, she is a senior professor of medicine and nephrology uh, in Alexandria University, and she is very civilized, and we learned from her a lot of ethics. Professor Haya. Thank you very much, Professor Hussein. I welcome all the speakers. 
and really and enjoy this uh, alarming and very bell, uh, ring the bell for all the researchers, as I said before. And uh, this is very important issue because most of us are not taking care of these points and make it without any consideration. I, can I say to Dr. Halawa, if can help me, uh, is it imperialism for the methods and for the references? Sometimes they put it alarming and this is, is a quotation or it is taken before. Uh, how to do with this condition? How can I answer for the uh, editors for these comments? And also, I, if abstract are given in a conference and then you publish this work, you put the abstract the same. Oh. Uh, is any have to change your abstract when you put it in a publication or you can put the same abstract of your from the other conference you did it? I, I will answer the second question, but, but, but I didn't get the first question. Basically, this is, you know, when you publish an abstract uh, presented in a conference, this is yes. called conference paper. Yeah. So uh, it's well known, it will be cited as conference paper. So you don't need to change anything because it's your own work and um, it's your, your work, your own work also. How can written... I answer the, the editors? Because they make this your abstract, it is seated before in, in an abstract, in say in a, the GAP journal. Yes. And I said to him that it is mine or something like this. And there is no harm from, you know, most of the published work have been presented before. Yes. Or yes, you yes. presented after. So yes. uh, a presentation is another form, you know, yes. uh, you know uh, uh, or just uh, you know, giving a lecture is another form of presenting your work, like writing your work. I think there's no yes. harm from that. And okay. we do this all the time. It's legal. It, we, actually, we have to. We have to present our work. Learners, okay. colleagues, are either visual or audiovisual or audio. So somebody listens only and not interested to say, but okay. others would like to read the visual and 50% um, of the population are mixed. So they would like to read the slides or read you know, the paper and listen. So you know, different forms of uh, passing the message. Um, uh, there's no harm from that. No, this is, this is a standard actually. Okay. I, the first question can about sometimes they highlight that uh, some word in the method or the title of the method they highlighted. Of course, this method, the title of this method, are written before or it is present, um, okay. given the, the company from where we get the, the substance, it is written before. They highlighted. How can answer that it is a common? Or, or uh, this uh, substance are present yeah, yeah, from this company, yeah. I will put it. Yeah. And even but, the reference, sometimes they highlight it. The reference is quoted. Yani. How can it change the reference? No, no, no. The reference should, you know, if it's quoted, it's their problem. Because the reference should be, shouldn't be caught uh, in, in Belgium's software. The software yeah. actually... Yeah. There exclude. Is a, a exclude. Yeah, exclude. to exclude quotation, to exclude Belgium's, uh, to exclude... Uh, reference. Uh, Yes. But the methods, I agree with you, you know, but you have to, to be honest, it's easy to reword it. Okay. You know, Western blot was done using uh, Elijah Technique. Yes. Yeah, you can say yeah, I, yeah, Elijah yeah. Technique was, uh, you know, was, uh, with a method of choice in, in doing Western block. I, I changed yes. the word, I changed the sentence. So oh, to I, avoid all this dilemma, it just yeah. rephrase, don't forget, it is a software hasn't got a brain, hasn't, it does not think, will match word for I word. Think the editor should take care of this part. It is already, you cannot change the name of the test, you cannot change no, the cannot. name of the company. Oh, so yes. it, I think the method cannot be a pergarism, it's but, just a method. Yeah, okay. but okay. The, remember the software actually, it picks up sentences, you know, 10 words in sequence, you yeah. know, rather than single word, you know. Uh, okay. Let us say, Cairo. Cairo is everywhere. So, you know, yeah. I can't pick the word Cairo, but they will, yeah. they, they will pick up the sentence being repeated as it is. Okay. And you can adjust it. Is it 10 words or more? If you like to be harsh, so you, okay. you, 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 you tune it to be more than, let's say, 25 words. 
but usually, you know, two into, you know, 10, 10 words in, in, in sequence. Okay, thank you very yeah. much, Professor Hayam. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for your all. Thank you, Professor Hussein. And no. good luck. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Dr. David? Um, <clears throat> just a just, um, uh, comment on, on, on what you said, and I wanted to comment on what you said as well about the drugs. So okay. I think, um, I think as, as Dr. Tidore said, um, ethics is quite important because it empowers us when we make our decisions later on. It uh, helps us challenge the status quo. So uh, as, a, as a young pharmacist, you would see things that you, and you just think, well, this is what's happening because that's what's happening. Was in, if you have a good ethical understanding and, and understanding of some of the things that, uh, that were mentioned, you're able to critique what's happening and refer to your own ethical standing. And that supports you in making decisions, supports you in saying no, or as what happened with the example that Professor Halal mentioned, supports you in saying yes when you want to perform an operation, um, when you think that this is the right thing to do. Because if you, were, if, you, if you didn't have this ethical understanding or this ethical training, you would think, well, th these are the rules, I, I, this, my hands are tied. However, because you've got this understanding and you understand what happened historically, you're able to do this. And uh, commenting on what you said about um, about the excessive drug use. So another another hat I, I used to wear. So I, I was um, um, in a previous job. I was the medication safety officer. So my my research interest is as always as well as also around medication safety. And if we look at you know the figures, so sixty percent of uh, of drugs prescribed in the elderly are not necessary. Well, up to sixty two percent are not necessary. Uh, half of hospital admission and emergency care sometimes can be attributed to unnecessary dosage. We're talking with, with, with proper medication review, you can reduce uh, medication related incidents to by 80%. So there's a lot of stuff around uh, prescribing things unnecessarily. And sometimes people do something for the sake of doing something. So they prescribe something for the sake of prescribing something. Again, there's an ethical issue here. It's not just people are prescribing because they are encouraged to do so because of uh, their companies or whatever. There's also my own, my own role. How do I understand my own role from an ethical perspective? So you find yourself as a pharmacist, um, or doing a lot of deep prescribing. So you know you're asking a lot of medication to be stopped, etc. So again, there's an ethical aspect here, that's asking you to well, can I do more? Similarly to the patient on the table, can I do more and treat this patient even though I don't have to? Um, so I think all of this helps helps us um, ground our ground all the new students, new healthcare professionals, in ethics and help them, help support them and empower them to do, make uh, decisions that are more beneficial for the patients and for their practice, uh, for everyday practice. I agree with you 100% uh, uh, to the extent that in our clinical rounds, we teach the residents and the, the registrar about the prescription style. For example, proton bump inhibitors nowadays, I am a big advocate advocator for stopping them because in the majority of the patient, there is no necessity to continue PPIs and proton bomb inhibitors. Thank you very much for the, your comment, Dr. David. Uh, Professor Saeed Khamis, last comment, because we are two hours now. Okay, thanks, Professor uh, Titora. I have two questions, Professor Titora. Number one, uh, from ethical point of view, uh, if we have this uh, hemodialysis unit and we put big sign that this is for hep C, this hep B patient, this for HIV patient, Number one, is it ethical to put these signs clear for the visitor, clear for the other patients? That's number one question. Number so, two. So let, let us answer, answer this question. If we put signal on the patient for discrimination, and discrimination yeah. is obvious to all patients, is it ethical, yeah. Dr. Tudor? Well, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Now, now, to be honest, I'm not an, a medical expert, so I'm, I'm a philosopher as a training. Um, the the only way the the science for me will make sense is the if there would be a medical problem. So if, for example, uh, someone can catch um, HIV by using the wrong machine, uh, you know what I mean. So if if there is no danger for 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 people's life, I don't think that should be a sign there. Uh, so if they are medically safe, they should not be assigned. If if there is a, a danger, although I cannot I, I cannot imagine, but as I said, I don't have the medical knowledge to uh, to certify that. 
uh, then for me is no reason to... If you allow me, I, I have a comment here. If uh, the uh, situation of the patient put others in danger or the healthcare workers in danger, it, not, not, no problem for uh, isolating even patients who isolate hepatitis B patients in a special corner and special nurse and special uh, 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 blood pressure recording, everything is special for hepatitis B patient because of the severity and of the risk of transmission of infection. But for the GCI, and quality accreditation hospitals, the minor, I cannot say this is the, um, uh, there are some, some points that uh, I can use colors. I can uh, put on the, in the bed, red, uh, green circle, blue circle, without writing, yeah. this is male, this is female, this is whatever they say, they, they discriminate. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So if, if it is not, it is not risky, uh, it's not risky we, we should be smart enough not to. Yeah. Uh, yeah. From the ethical side, as I said, if you put HIV patients, you already disclose medical mm -hmm. information about someone who is on a chair because it's, you know, so then, then you basically breach the, the confidentiality rules because mm -hmm. the others, not only that is stigmatizing and so on, but you, you say something about the disease the others have. So that's why yes. I think your system with the color might be more appropriate or, you know, just creating, I don't know, separate words or something. Yes. So if the, yes, if the health state deserve, uh, 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 necessitate isolation, we should isolate the patient. And the patients, okay. by large, will know that it is the corner for hepatitis B, this is the corner for hepatitis C. So, but for minor issues, it, from ethical point of view, it is better not to stratify the patient because it is not uh, human. Okay. Those information, yes. Yes, yes. Yeah. Second is, uh, and the last thing is, uh, if I am, uh, suppose that I am the head of the medical department and I wanted to organize the annual conference of uh, my department, and I asked a pharmaceutical company X to sponsor this uh, uh, congress or co conference, is it ethical or unethical to do like this? Thank you. Dr. Tudora and Dr. David, because <laughs> Dr. David is interested in drugs. <laughs> so... Uh, well, it's uh, it's quite complicated because you know we all need money. We know all need sponsorship to to disseminate our research. You you need money to go to do good things. Uh, for me, the problem is, uh, and I, I say that about lots of time about what is conflict of interest or what is unethical stuff, where by benefiting from this money becomes you know a mean in itself and not, what can I say? That yes. you organize something or you do something or you push stuff in, in some direction, direction just because of the money. You know what I mean? If we you use this money for a good cause, it's okay. But if you, uh, basically, if you let yourself be bought by this company and you do something for them that is um, on a, you know, gray zone of yes. uh, academic, yeah, yeah. <laughs> misconduct yes. and maybe it, it's problematic and it is it is in, especially in state there is a there is a wonderful book um, um, about it's called the black coat and it starts beautifully with the donuts the pharmaceutical company was providing a certain hospital and then the guy said he worked inside and then at the moment said the donuts stopped tasting good because then he realized you know the the infiltration of the pharmaceutical company in um, funding certain type of research and so on. But it's, uh, again, by the end of the day, to, because pharmaceutical companies have to develop, have to, have to create drugs. We all need drugs, you know. Um, but it's, it's where things start to, you know, where you feel, I think you feel when, when yes. things are on it. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the, concept, yeah. the concept is this entangling from uh, companies. Because if I have the profit from this, away from science and uh, it, is, it is prohibited. And I think the regulations are nowadays more firm in the Western communities. Dr. David, the mic is to you. I'll tell you an example. So um, one time in a previous job, we invited a drug company to give us a talk on inhalers. So, uh, so the inhaler was, the, the talk on their inhalers was really good. The talk about other inhalers was not as good. So from then on, we knew that they have not hit the brief that we asked them to do. So I think it's a matter of, like you said, disentangling it 
from mm -hmm. what we're asking them to do. If we know, if we can be reassured that we'll be getting uh, an impartial uh, experience, whatever it is, whether in terms of education or in terms of, or we, we're getting this, the autonomy that we're desiring, then I think that's fine. Um, but I think there's an element, there has to be an element of uh, previous experience with that particular model or that particular company. And, and I've, had, that, we've had, we've had experience where it didn't work so well. There was no financial gain, but they were still, they were offering a service. However, this service was still not as good as what we would have expected um, or what we've asked for. So maybe conflict of interest, and this is what Absolutely. for all speakers, uh, the uh, speakers should mention dis disclosing there is no company. Yeah. Because yeah. even if, the, if there's 100% science, and I know that uh, Dr. Saeed is working with Roche, for example, or whatever the company, even, if, <laughs> <laughs> even, <laughs> if, even if Professor Saeed mentioned everything is in science 100%, I'm going to yeah, uh, yeah, right you are, by suspicion. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, so this is why, from ethical point of view, uh, all of us Perhaps. should disclose yeah. if there is yeah. any link with companies or any profit uh, to avoid conflict of interest. Yes, uh, sir. Thank I, I think in, in, um, um, I have no words except I'm very appreciating Professor Halawa intention for this webinar. It was a brainstorming for us and we will, we will seek to improve our standards because we have the checker for plagiarism, but I think the, it needs to be um, addressed by a more professional manner. Thank you very much, Professor Halawa, for uh, this very, very interesting and exciting two Zoom meetings. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Theodora, for keeping with us. Uh, we are appreciating your humbleness, your expertise, and your courses for ethics are fundamental, not for University of Liverpool, but fundamental for all uh, the world. Dr. David, uh, I'm happy um, and appreciating your presence with us today. Thank you very much and uh, goodbye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you, Professor Faisal. And, and the video will be uploaded uh, either this night or uh, next morning. Thank you and goodbye. Goodbye.